Good afternoon, Mrs. President. It's a Good afternoon. Great pleasure to have you here in a way, but to know you in Tallinn also at the same time. Thank you so much for joining us in Humboldt University Berlin and to give us your Humboldt lecture. Now, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to all of you, a warm welcome to the President of the Republic of Estonia, this is Kerstin Kaljulaj. It's a great pleasure to meet this afternoon. Um, we have some hope since yesterday that the crisis may perhaps be over sooner than some of us expected. It's such uh, just a hope. But if it happens that the speech of the Estonian president would have been the only digital Humboldt reader, it would be correct because as far as I know, your country, Estonia, is the most digitized we have in Europe as far as my knowledge is, but we will learn about it certainly in your speech. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a warm welcome to you all. I also uh, extend my welcome to the Dean of the Law Faculty, to the Ambassador of Estonia, to Germany, Mr. Streimann, and uh, the Deputy Head of Mission, Mr. Pibo, who helped us so much in preparing it. I would now quickly pass the word to the Vice President of our University, uh, Dr. Kohntaler, who has, will televise his, um, his words of welcome at this very moment. Your Excellency President Kajulait, dear Professor Ruffert, dear audience. On behalf of the Humboldt University to Berlin, I would like to express my great thanks to you, President Kajulait, for giving a Humboldt speech despite the adverse conditions of the pandemic. We are all very honored by this. Especially in these times, we could not imagine a better guest. In the past four years, President Kajulait has been the head of state of a country that is considered a pioneer in digitalization. She is the first woman in this position, and according to Forbes magazine, she was one of the 22 most influential female political leaders in 2017. Apart from that, she was elected European of the Year in Estonia back in 2009. Regarding the topic of the speech, we could not be happier too. The COVID-19 pandemic has irrevocably shown us how important and inevitable digital transformation is. In recent months, many weaknesses have become apparent in Germany and other member states. But those weak points can also be opportunities to improve in the future. This is why we are very excited to hear about Mrs. President's ideas on how the European Union should support member states in overcoming difficulty, difficulties on digital issues. As a vice president for inter alia operations of this university, I am partly also in charge of digital matters. You can be sure that digitalization is also a core challenge for our university in these times and beyond. As you all know, the Humboldt speeches have a long tradition dating back to the speech of the then German Minister of Foreign Affairs, Joschka Fischer. We are more than pleased to have within this series of speeches an Estonian speaker with us again after the Humboldt speech of former president Thomas Hendrik Ilves back in 2008. Please give a warm welcome to President Kajulait. President Kajulait, the stage is yours. Well, Your Excellency, President Kajulait, dear Professor Rufat, dear Dr. Kronthaler, dear students, Dear ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests behind the screens, this Humboldt speech, as Dr. Kronthaler pointed out already, is taking place under very different circumstances than previous speeches. Given the pandemic and circumstances as they are, I'm even more grateful to have the honor to welcome you today on behalf of Stiftung Mercator. 
Stiftung Mercator, for those um, who haven't heard much of us yet, is a private foundation that wants to strengthen Europe's cohesion and its ability to act. To reach this goal, we believe it is important that policymakers and civil society actors discuss and work together with the aim of enhancing European cohesion and cooperation based on core values. The current COVID-19 pandemic poses a major challenge towards this goal, given a growing polarization in many European states as a reaction on certain corona, corona measures introduced by the respective governments. The pandemic, without any question, has put Europe even more under pressure, and the idea of a united Europe has suffered a loss of confidence. Especially at the beginning of the pandemic, when many of us saw a Europe that appeared divided and not capable of acting together. We believe international dialogue, solidarity, and cooperation within Europe are therefore more important than ever. At the same time, digital transformation is one of the key issues coming up from the global pandemic. A functioning digital environment can support us in times in which we have to avoid physical contact. The topic of digital transformation points out to two global trends that are going to shape Europe in the future. The importance of a functioning rule-based international order and the impact of artificial intelligence in our societies. Stiftung Mercator is aware of these global trends. For this reason, we have decided to make research on Europe's role in a changing international environment and on the social consequences of digital transformation to two of our main funding priorities for the next five years. At the same time, we will continue to encourage and promote the dialogue between decision makers, policy makers and citizens with a particular focus on young people as it's the idea of we sind Europa, we are Europe. Therefore, we at Stiftung Mercator are very pleased to continue supporting the Humboldt speech within this project, we are Europe. This cooperation project between Stiftung Zukunft Berlin, Humboldt University Berlin, and the International Journalist Program enables young people, journalists, and civil society actors to discuss their ideas with European decision makers and actively shape the future of Europe. I would therefore like to thank all our project partners for working towards this goal and for organizing today's event. My special thanks, of course, goes to today's speaker, President Kersti Kaljulaj. Madam President, thank you very much for being with us today and sharing your thoughts on the future of Europe and the potential of digitalization for our societies and democracies. This being said, the floor, or better the screen, is yours, Madam President. Thank you for this uh, nice introductory words to everybody. And, uh, and uh, I'm very happy that we can have uh, nowadays uh, this technological alternative to, uh, to our meetings. Uh, in fact, I am sitting in splendid self-isolation because uh, I have been in, um, in contact with somebody who had virus five days ago. So uh, I would not have been able to come to Berlin for at least double reasons, but please welcome to the office of Estonian president, which was in 1938 specifically built for our first president, is still decorated as it was by our first president, even if communists occupied this building for 50 years for high functions. No normal Estonian could ever in these 50 years enter this room, but here you are now together with me 30 years after Estonia restored its independence uh, with uh, quite a lot of help from Germany as well. And probably when Germany and other European countries uh, who uh, supported Estonian aspirations towards also European Union, you did it according to the principle that each and every nation has the right to choose their future. And if Estonians wanted to see their future within the European Union, then you supported us. You never thought that you are creating, uh, helping to create, helping to support a catalyst for 21st century. Because obviously with Estonian e-governance model, which allows us to call ourselves the world's first uh, 
totally digitally transformed state uh, actually has acted uh, in the European Union, has a catalyst for change. And maybe you do not expect me to say this, but I do say this. European Union, collectively, is the world's best developed GovTech space. Yes, you heard me right. Normally, we do think that the United States is so far ahead in digital development. We talk about GAF, or we are worried that we don't have in Europe uh, big enough digital companies. But all those who are thinking this way are missing some very important elements, which we have in Europe and no other region has. And this is our legally permissive space for digital governance models to evolve. What do I mean by this? First, we managed to, to create GDPR. And second, we have our ADAS system. We have commonly in Europe an understanding, which was now supported also by the uh, conclusions of the Council during the German presidency, that each and every European citizen should have a digital ID. What does this give us? Digital ID gives us access to safe, regulated digital space where both governments and private sector equally can offer safe services to citizens who are able to identify themselves and identify those with whom they act and transact. Take notice, such a system, neither national nor international, exists nowhere in the world. Yes, many cities in the United States, for example, are offering loads of applications which people can download from App Store and access public services. But each and every app acts separately. Each and every time a citizen uses these apps, they need to give their data again and again. So it looks like it's a network of metro stations which is not connected with the line. Here in Europe, we have taken a different route. And I really want to believe that the Estonian model had something to do with it, because I personally felt, felt in 2017 during Estonian Council presidency that that was the moment when European leaders realized that it is not an option for governments to guarantee digital IDs, therefore internet safety for their citizens, but they felt it's an obligation. And I totally share that it is an obligation. Because what is a digital ID? Digital ID is just a passport. It is a passport which you are using in internet space. And if we now think on the street space, we don't trust anybody in real world, in analog world, who doesn't identify themselves. You are not going to act or transact with people who just say what is their name. You demand a valid document to prove who they are. The same in internet. Digital ID is nothing but a passport which allows our citizens to act and transact safely online. And European Union has created collectively the first steps for achieving this opportunity for all European citizens. How it came about indeed was by individual experiences of various European countries. It is true that Estonia probably is the only one which is able to offer all its public services online and opens the same access model, the same digital ID platform to our private sector companies, also without any limitations. But there are other digital ecosystems in other European countries. Finland uses the same as Estonia by now. Iceland is joining us on the same platform. Denmark has a really good digital system, uh, which uh, does lack only uh, an ADAS compatible digital ID. Portugal also has a really good e-governance model already in place. And this, by the way, considering e-residency as Estonia as a next step. So you see, Europe has been building for years now already an integrated safe digital space for our citizens, our companies and our governments to safely act and transact online. 
By the way, each and every German also has nowadays access to digital ID. You can use it. Just the problem is that there are not enough services linked to this single digital ID. In Estonia, right from the start, we decided that our digital space is open equally to private and public sector, which meant therefore that all services started to use the same platform. And why was private sector ready to do that? It is quite obvious if you think about it. Digital ID is not only a technology, it is a legal space. It is protected by the law. And therefore, if you use instead of your own identity or some nickname system or some token, you use digital ID offered by the state. In addition to technological security, you get legal security as well. And this is very important. Estonia, by the way, has not created any interesting technology to use digital IDs and, uh, and uh, provide all public service online. What we have created and what is interesting is exactly this legal space which surrounds this technology. Tech-wise, we have been just quick followers using what had been created elsewhere for provision of public services. Because if you look what we are using, I mean, in all private companies, I believe also already 20 years ago, bigger ones in Germany, at least, you had internet systems, you had certain level of uh, internet services provision for the companies and their clients. The only thing which differed was that public sector somehow was not part of it. It is now more and more becoming part of it. It is difficult for the governments today because they are late incomers. They now need to come in, establish themselves in digital space and also start to create the laws around the digital space to make sure that citizens, their data is always protected. In Estonia, for example, the government takes responsibility for my data, but it also states clearly that it doesn't own my data, which means that the government is obliged to inform me if any government office, rather of official than office, has checked on my data. So I would know, and if I don't think that this particular office had anything to do with looking at my data, I can protest and the state looks into the matter and may take the offending people to the court. It's a criminal offense in Estonia to nose around in databases. You can never nose around in database which concerns all information about any, anybody. But let's say you are a nurse in a hospital, then as a nurse in a hospital, you have access to the e-health files of patients. But this doesn't mean that you are allowed to look into each and every file. You are only allowed to look into the files which you need to work on. And the patients would probably recognize if you had something doing with them, then they would not protest. But if you see somebody else's fingerprints on your file, because digitally you always have a fingerprint if somebody looks, then the patients know that, I mean, they, you didn't have anything to do with their file and they can complain and you are taken to the court. This is just an example of a regulated but permissive legal space for working with the data. Very similar systems are growing in various European countries and the European Union Council decision now exists which says that each and every European Union citizen must have a digital ID, which is ADAS compatible. And to be ADAS compatible, all governments have to follow similar safety rules, as I was describing. Very often people ask, is digital safe? And my answer always is that if you have a smart technology and the legally permissive space for technology development, which protects the data, protects people, protects businesses and also governments, then 
yes, you can never say that things are 2000% safe, nothing is so safe, but you can easily demonstrate that it is safer than on paper. How to illustrate that? Let me turn back to the example of doctors and nurses. You have probably somewhere in your doctor's office a file. I have two, but mine is digital, yours is on paper. And if you now honestly think to yourself, do you really know, can you be sure that yesterday afternoon, nobody was reading your file? Then you cannot be sure, but I can be sure. Because if anybody wanted to access my e-health file, I would see the fingerprints. So we can easily demonstrate that digital is actually safer than paper. And this is what allows us to move ahead with the European project of interconnected digital public space. If we can collectively understand it, then we must realize and must be proud that in GovTech, Europe has a global advantage. If we are able to really carry through this decision that each and every European citizen has a digital ID, we can easily develop data clouds where we can all collectively work from afar without going to our offices, without even entering the country where you're working. It was a year ago only when it was terribly difficult to make people understand that this is a positive development for most of us. But the unhappy situation which we are now facing has uncovered for each and everybody that in developed nations in Europe, about 30% of the jobs are geograph geographically neutral. You can do them from wherever you are, but you can only do your jobs from wherever you are. If you have safe access to data, which is verifiable that it is also you who is accessing the data. European Union has the legal space for that. But this space, of course, is not complete. If we look what Europe needs to do and is also gradually doing, we need also to create the European data space, a common data space which would have the rules guaranteeing the data safety, but at the same time, access, which I was just describing. Because in principle, there is absolutely no reason why somebody from Estonia cannot work in Germany as a bookkeeper, or in Portugal, or in Norway, going out of the union, but remaining in the European economic area. But the access to the data and the safety and control over who had accessed the data. If we achieve this system, we make the European services market truly global. And we will also radically change our goods market. Because if you think of a good, something manufactured, then in fact, quite a lot of it is design, engineering work. This doesn't need to be done on site. This can be done as a service wherever globally in principle, but definitely on the common European market elsewhere. And in principle, maybe in 20 years time, all the production will be very much regionalized by the same development, which means that somebody designs, somebody engineers, and then the producer is only looking for the closest factory, which is able to print out this kind of good. See, this is a radical change of how we define our economies. And this change is already here. And luckily, European Union has a regulator, has understood it. There are a few other elements, artificial intelligence, for example. We need to make sure that our artificial intelligence in free world and in Europe is able to be as smart as some of our competitors, AI. The problem nowadays is that we haven't been able to create for our AI, a legally permissive space to learn in order to be smart enough for us. We need to quickly come to the conclusion that in free world for data safety, but at the same time for artificial intelligence development, we need to define our objectives on how we see companies and governments need to keep data safe 
And we should try to do this across all economic sectors and over different generations of technology. Why this is important? It is because the legal cycle nowadays is longer than tech cycle. And if you try to regulate technology as it stands today, then five years from now, this legal space will be outdated. Hence, we need to define our objective in a technology neutral way for artificial intelligence. We need to define and say, data has to be kept safe according to these rules. Data also has to be disposed of according to these rules. And enterprises and entities gathering the data, they have to fit certain criteria. Both entities and technology itself has to be able to explain to regulators that it is fulfilling these criteria. Luckily, technologies are able to explain themselves to us mere humans. This is one of the uh, basic principles of AI development uh, in the free world. It has to be able to explain itself to us. And this way, if we will set the objectives and thereafter leave the entities, be it business or governments, to achieve these objectives in a demonstrable way, our AI can learn as quickly as AI, which is based on the data gathered from totalitarian societies where all these data safety worries do not arise. It's possible to do if we stop trying to regulate pathways to safety, but we should regulate the objectives. What's the difference? Let me turn back for a second to, uh, again, the example of hospitals. When we have all the files on the paper, we say hospital has to keep all the files safe. And that's it. That's a regulated objective. We do not try to regulate pathway to this objective. We do not say that this data has to be kept no lower than on fifth floor, in a room which has this kind of a door, in a safe which has, let's say, red, which is red, in a windowless or with windows room. We don't prescribe all these details, but maybe because of our fear of technology, when we come to regulating tech, we try to describe, describe also the pathway to safety, which let's face it, sounded admittedly ridiculous if I tried to post them on the analog world. Yet, for some reason, we haven't been able to overcome this kind of thinking in tech world but we need to. This is something which we need to do together in Europe, definitely. This is a must. Now, and this is my final, final point. I will thereafter rather discuss with you, dear listeners, uh, the digital change in Europe. How to do all this change and how to provide this digital safe space for our citizens so that it will also be not, um, not um, for only smart and learned elites of our society. How to do it in a way that it is supporting the egalitarian natures of our societies. This is very important, let's admit. We have seen during the last decade, many European societies breaking heart over the inequality, intergenerational poverty and hopelessness. We must stop this. And digital space, if, allowed, if, if developed safely, will allow us to do so. First, digital technologies do not only support the working environment and the market power of the well-learned and educated. There are already, and there could be much more if encouraged, people in quite simple jobs who benefit from internet. Let's see warehouse keepers, very simple job. You need to monitor in some warehouses the temperature, the humidity. In some warehouses, you need to monitor the coming in and going out of the goods. But none of these jobs nowadays need to be done from the spot. You can all do them from the distance. So in principle, you can monitor several warehouses from your own home or from a Mediterranean beach, if you so wish. It gives you quite a lot of market power because you can sell simultaneously to several companies in several countries seeking the best conditions for you, provided that not only our digital legal space, but our labor market legal space allows for that. 
It can be egalitarian. Take handicraft people. We have real examples here in Estonia of people who work this way. I know one man who makes bows and arrows and he comes from South Africa originally, but now has settled in a little village in Estonia. His bows and arrows are world class, but here in Estonia, nobody buys them. I mean, they are up market, really. So the closest clients are about thousand kilometers away. So you can sell your handicraft globally nowadays without going anywhere. 200 years ago, the productivity of handicraftsmen was limited by their capacity to sell on the nearby markets. 100 years ago, by the capacity of them to agree with souvenir shops, for example. That was already a huge rise on productivity if they were not traveling the markets themselves. Now the world is their market. Similarly, people who have, uh, well, hard, well, hard, uh, let's say, are facing hard conditions and cannot exit their home very easily, maybe because they are handicapped, maybe because they live in the countries which does not allow, let's say, women to go out freely on the street, or they simply live in an area where they are afraid of uh, being out, let's say, later in the evenings. You can work from distance in many jobs without leaving the safety of your home, your town, your country, for us to make sure that this digital space also serves those. Also those who have, uh, by tradition in our society, a heavier uh, homework burden. Yes, I mean, younger women with children. In digital space, you don't have to work from nine to five. You don't have to leave your home if the children are chick sick. You can work when you can and where you can, alternating your job tasks with your home course. Yes, it's not an ideal world, but it allows people to have a better work and life balance if they need it, which also means that women are not left behind on career ladders when they are having children. And my last example concerns handicapped people. Even they can benefit from internet. Let's take a very simple example. You have an autistic person who likes knitting red socks. You know, they are very routine person sometimes. He really does beautiful red socks. Now, 20, 30 years ago, such a person would have been on social benefits because probably in the village where he or she lives or in, even in a town, there are not enough takers for the red socks. Simply not big enough market for this kind of monotonous product. In addition, these kind of people are afraid of other people. They don't want to go out and negotiate. Nowadays, the world is the market. Billions of people, among them, definitely there is plenty of demand for red, red socks supported by a nice story. And in addition, you can sell without ever seeing your clients. These examples demonstrate that digital can be safe, digital can be inclusive, Digital needs to be supported by a legally permissive environment. We are ahead globally in providing such a legally permissive and safe environment for GovTech and also our private companies. And we have a lot and lots, lots and lots of work to do to make sure that with next and next tech cycle, we'll keep these advantages for European citizens. Thank you for listening and I am ready to discuss with you and uh, also answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam President, for honoring us and giving your speech, and in particular for the clarity and committedness that was shown uh, in your speech. I'm sure that our listeners uh, will ask questions just to instead of the applause that doesn't exist in the digital space, to my regret, I just wish to tell you that the number of listeners rose while you were speaking to us. So what, what could be better if there's no acoustic applause than that? Thank you so much. Now, those who wish to ask a question have to raise their, as it is in that software, blue hand. And I will call them up and 
you are free as a somebody who asks a question to click on the button and we will see you when speaking. That's not obligatory, but if you so wish, uh, my assistant Isaac Klinger will uh, provide this. So the first question is asked by Mr. Hofmeister. And perhaps we can see you. Great. Yes, indeed. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Thank you very much for your precise uh, comments. Um, I have two very brief questions. You've spoken about data space, about digital ID, about regulation, especially on artificial intelligence. Are these for you the main components of a European digital sovereignty as it was discussed yeah, so loudly during these uh, past couple of months? And the second question is, what do you think of a European digital currency? Do we need something like that? Is that uh, the future of the Euro? Is that something that our common space, our common uh, market needs in, in your opinion? Thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed, sovereignty in digital space uh, stems from uh, digital IDs, which the governments provide and guarantee. And I do not mean sovereignty in limiting access to operating or cooperating with the European data space, but I mean maintaining control of who has accessed what, where, and how. For this, indeed, digital ID is the only tool. Digital ID, when both sides are using it, creates also an encrypted channel, so nobody can listen in. But there are also people who think that we should somehow seal off our European data space and not allow outsiders to access it. By this, we would greatly limit the development of a global services market. I don't think that would be a wise decision. I think we should allow for global services market. But that means that we need to either accept digital IDs if they are good quality enough of third countries or provide digital IDs of ourselves to third country citizens like Estonia is doing. Estonia does provide e-residency cards and this has nothing doing with physical residency. It simply allows you access into our digital ecosystem to work here to let's say you have a company which is in, in, in Estonia, you want to file your tax declarations, you can do it in digital space. We had to give this opportunity to third country citizens and also other European citizens, of, of course, for the simple reason that you cannot file papers on paper in Estonia. I mean, offices don't exist, or at least they are not numerous enough. It's still a right if you want to do everything on paper, but nobody does want it. So we opened the space also for the third country citizens. But this means we are controlling the safe ecosystem of Estonian digital ID protected part of internet. And the same will exist for Europeans if we are smart in its creation. On digital currency, if I think of this global services market and imagine that let's say my own son who, uh, who normally works and generally works over internet, he used to have a team of co-workers co in Serbia and they were doing projects for Botswana and Oman, for example. I mean, these people independently and not linked to any company, they work in various enterprises in various countries and they need a space in which they can be paid where they can also prove that they have been paid, let's say 10,000 euros and not 8,000 or not 12,000. They need it in a way that they can prove these earnings to their tax board. And not only that they at least earn this, but that they didn't earn more. They need to be able to create this kind of income, take this into their tax declarations, pay taxes and receive for these taxes services from government. To make things even more difficult, governments need to provide these services globally because our citizens are digital nomads. They can sit in the kitchen and work in 10 countries, but at the same time, they can also work in one company, but move around the world globally. 
nowadays, what's your option? I mean, people pay you on your PayPal account and then what? It's pretty hard and difficult to prove your earnings and make this your legal income, which also provides you access to the social system. To help people with all that, yes, I do believe we need some kind of uh, digital currency. Otherwise, we cannot afford this kind of free digital global market where everybody has their own market power and can work wherever they wish. So yes, indeed, at one point we need. Thank you so much, Madam President. Now, most of the listeners are students of our university. We have also PhD students. But the next question will be asked by, I think, somebody from the press, which is Mrs. Mele Pesti. Hello. Yes, here I am. Yes. Um, Thanks so much for the inspiring speech. Uh, I am indeed a fellow of the International Journalist Program, an Estonian journalist working at the moment here in Berlin, Germany. And uh, as an Estonian journalist working in Berlin, I bear witness to Estonian great fame uh, with, in the digital success story. I must admit it was even um, to my surprise how uh, well uh, these stories here have tra traveled. Uh, so as my first question, actually, as I know that our president is very, very well informed about all the latest um, technical solutions uh, that are even not out there often, uh, if she would be willing to share uh, any new um, interesting solution being, being uh, coming out from, from Estonia, maybe, perhaps related also to the times where we are living now and restrictions or not. <laughs> and I have a second question also, uh, something from the speech um, about the legal space for labor market uh, was very interesting uh, that was mentioned. Um, I meant to ask if you see that um, unifying that and, and um, reforming that to better fit the needs of society now is going as well uh, and, and as fast as, as the other part of the legal space for, for the digital solution. And especially, I mean, like digital nomads were, were mentioned, uh, the gig economy is really becoming more and more important. Uh, uh, is it all coming together also so that the um, nomads and anybody else who is uh, doing um, on other contract basis than it was to use, usual in the traditional society, uh, would they be better involved? welfare and anything else. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll start from the end. Uh, legal space, no, it's not developing quickly enough because I see that uh, our political thinking is quite a lot behind the curve in understanding these developments in society. And I believe that it's not only for the EU, but also for the World Trade Organization, for example, and also for the OECD to promote this kind of thinking and providing solutions. Because if we do not quickly react and act, then happens something which we don't want. And it is the following. The better of people who are digital nomads will leave our social models and seek private uh, uh, insurance, private education. They go out of the system and uh, buy their security in a different way. The rest of us who are not able to make so good living see that the uh, tax money of a government is diminishing and decreasing. And therefore they will be having less and less good quality redistribution of services, education, healthcare, or the social support mechanism. So if we are even more late than we are already now, we risk to lose our social market economy model of Europe. This is a specific European problem, of course, because I mean, in, in many other uh, our partner countries in, in Europe, in, in the world, who are also democracies and free market economies, citizens do not expect governments to provide for their, uh, for their support in such an extent like we in Europe. So for us, this is the most urgent to make this legal space to develop. You asked about the uh, Estonian uh, developments. I will mention two maybe tracks. 
One track is that indeed now already 7% of Estonian GDP comes from ICT related services. And an interesting area of uh, practical law and D work, which I see is work on post quantum IDs, because as soon as quantum computing comes along, the current digital ID mechanisms uh, are very easy to break in. So we need to be ready a uh, solution for post quantum period, definitely. And there is quite a lot of uh, research going on in private sector in Estonia, uh, in this area, by the way. And the second is something which is probably more easy to understand in the context of pandemic. We see now that all these uh, practical things which we do every day can have a big part of them made contactless if we do not want to have contact with other people. There is a dire need for such a service. And we see like everything from simple shopping to going to the doctor is going contactless. Estonians have, for example, an e-health system already long in place. And when the pandemic started, we only needed to add one button, according to which a citizen could start their own sick leave. So you didn't have to go to your doctor's office. You could notify online. You don't, didn't even have to call. You could notify simply that I'm sick. So your sick leave started automatically and your doctor later called back contactless service provision avoiding contaminating the doctor's offices, obviously. Similarly, quite a big proportions of shopping have gone online to the level that people are informed via an app that your goods are here, they are paying via an app. They're communicating only via apps without making a physical contact even with the de delivery guy or delivery man. And this provides an interesting opportunity for small businesses and local food producers, I have discovered. Because lots and lots of local food producers can channel their goods together right and straight to the biggest market in Estonia, which is Tallinn. All of a sudden, people are very open to these developments, which actually means that people have now gained a market advantage from the shift in how we consume. Thank you very much. Now, just before I give the floor to the next question, I wish to tell those who are putting their question in writing that I'm trying to read your question as soon as uh, possible. So, so the next speaker is somebody from our research training group at the law faculty, Paul Friedel. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Rufat, and uh, thank you, Madam President, for giving this very interesting speech um, and giving us insights on um, yeah all these um, technological systems that are set up in Estonia, which I think is really at the forefront here. Um, you talked a lot about how um, digital ID would make up for safe digital spaces. Um, and personally, I don't, I, I don't really know how much I ca can agree with that because I think um, there's also very specific security risks which come with these centralized systems. Um, and this is both, I guess, um, a, a technological question because um, if more data is gathered in um, central systems, that makes it an easy target and a very obvious target as well. Um, but obviously it's also connected to how much um, trust we are supposed to give to state officials um, here in Germany, um, especially over the last weeks and month, we have seen um, many cases and this is, this is not something that has only appeared recently, but um, is, is appearing um, day in, day out, um, that um, government officials are accessing data they are not supposed to access. Um, and are not really sticking to the rules as they are. Um, and obviously, um, if, if more data would be gathered in these centralized systems um, with digital IDs, um, that would make it even these risks for um, people's privacy and anonymity would, in my eyes, only increase. Um, also, you, you mentioned um, encrypted communication, but again, I would argue that 
there isn't really a need to have a centralized system to have encrypted communication. Um, and indeed, I, I guess there's a rather strong claim to have decentralized systems uh, in terms of privacy and online security. Um, so I'm just really wondering how you address these issues and what really are the security concepts that um, Estonia is setting in place to, um, to handle these um, risks? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, first of all, of course, such a thing like absolute safety exists only if you are, I mean, dealing with uh, death or taxes, as we all know. But it is very easy to demonstrate that digital is safer than paper. You can occasionally discover that civil servants have overstepped the line and checked the data, which they have already on you. I can do this by routine because each and every civil servant, by their name, by their own unique digital ID, has to check this data. So it's not by accident that we discover if somebody has been looking in the system, but it is a norm. For example, when my office checks national address database to invite people to the party, these people see this in the digital file. They know president's office was looking at the address database and they can query. And we have to answer them why we looked. Each and every citizen knows all the time in real time how their data has been treated by the government. On paper, this is impossible. So indeed, even if we cannot restrict the access of people to the data they don't need to look, the owner of the data knows this. And because it is a criminal offense, people don't do it. And they are prosecuted if they do it. Second, there is no such thing like central database. The only person in Estonia who can gather all the data from all databases about any citizen, me as well, is me. The civil servants only see the parts which they are by their job concerned, which means that the tax office civil servant can have access to my tax declaration, but they wouldn't, for example, know which cars I own. They don't know that. They have no access to my health data because centralized system in digital doesn't exist any more than on paper. Your analog passport, the paper passport, carries about you your name, birthplace, citizenship, nothing more. Digital ID similarly carries only this data about me. My digital ID code, my name, my place and time of birth. Nothing else is linked to the ID. I have to sign in into the system to allow, for example, in the pharmacy, the pharmacist to see what my doctor has prescribed me. Pharmacist cannot access my file unless I go and handle her the right to look who has prescribed me what. Otherwise, it's not possible. And if I lose my digital ID and somebody put, puts it into the digital ID reader, there is nothing more on this chip than exactly what you can read on it. Nothing more than exists also in your passport. So my claim is that while of course digital things can go wrong as well, they are safer than in paper. The other example of this kind of uh, digital being more safe than on paper. If you lose your passport, somebody looking quite similar to you can go into some office and claim this is their passport and transact on your name. If I lose my digital ID, this is useless for anybody who wants to take this chip and my card, which by the way is part of my travel card, which we use to travel inside the European Union. It's useless because they don't know the passcodes. Again, nothing of course is safe because I can write the passcodes pin one, pin two on my card and then lose my cards. But this comes down to basic cyber hygiene, which can be taught to people. And since we have a generation of people who have learned and lived in digital ID world, this never happens here, of course. But 
it's easy to see that at least it is safer than, than your paper passport. Again, there is no central database for government. It's all dispersed. Only I can gather all the data. If somebody else accesses that data, I will know, as opposed to paper files when you don't know which government office is reading your files. And I can query. Each and every office in this country has to tell me why they look. If they don't have a valid claim, to the court they go, and it's not me who is suing, but the state on my behalf. C, legal permissive space, but strict, regulation, strict, uh, strict regulation, very strict regulation. GDPR is piece of cake compared to the safety of Estonian digital ID ecosystem. Thank you, thank you very much, Madam President. Among those who ask written questions, apparently there's a great interest in how you protect yourselves in Estonia and how you would um, see this as an example against hacking. And uh, people are giving me a concrete example, apparently from Finland, from the Vastaamo Psychotherapy Center. Apparently this is a case that must be known around um, your part of Europe. Anyway, not the case itself, but what is the answer um, uh, against uh, criminal offenses against the whole system that might, may exist. I think that's a valid point and I'm sure you have a, a good and interesting answer on that. Yes, uh, first and foremost, um, governments need to do nothing more and nothing less than let's say our banks or insurance companies do to protect from hacking our data. In the case of banks, our money. They all doing it day in and day out and the hacking attacks are raining on each and every digital ecosystem nowadays. Same in private sector, same in public sector. So indeed, you have to constantly strive to be ahead of the hackers. You constantly have to monitor what is going on. Sometimes you even come under a widespread cyber attack. If you are then rich enough and big enough, you can even try to find out who did it. If you are Estonia, then you can uh, maybe even help some countries to take these attacks to the United Nations Security Council, like in March in case of Georgia, we did, for example. So you have numerous options of protecting yourself by technology and by the legal space. But here again, let's not forget it that, I mean, our money is in, in, in banks' accounts, which are all virtual and online. Mm. All kind of other data which private companies know about businesses, people, buildings is similarly in the databases. So government data is nothing specific. It's just it's as valuable for us. Governments take, of course, similar responsibility to private companies to keep it safe by technology, but also by training their people on how to handle the data. This is cyber hygiene. But what I want to stress here is there's nothing specific in the data which you share with the governments compared with the data which you share with the private companies. And sometimes people ask, I mean, and say, we here don't trust our government. Then my question is, why do you trust your bank if you don't trust your government? I don't know why. What have governments done to the free citizens of free world that people don't trust them? But in fact, there is no reason to trust more or less your bank than your government. And the measures they need to take are exactly the same. Yet you are peacefully living for 20 years with your banking data in somewhere in bank's internet, for which you have normally also digital access in Estonian case since 1996 already. What's the difference? The means and measures are the same, no difference. Thank, thank you so much. Now those um, I will call upon to give that question, please, that everybody can ask his or her question be brief. So the next one is Sophia Schiff. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. So thank you so much for answering our questions. And my question would be, do you see a social issue in the European digitalization? So Firstly, in the European integration, could there be a social um, issue there? And also in the global cooperation in general. So 
could there be an issue according to like a gap between poor and rich on a national basis, but also on a global basis. What do you think about that? Indeed, as I already told in the end of my lecture, if we do not play it inclusively, you might exclude parts of society. But if you play it inclusively, you start creating positive societal effects. For example, in Estonian case, when we started 20 years ago, We work together with not only governments, but private sector, notably banks and, uh, and internet companies and telecoms. And uh, they offer their services online free for uh, groups who normally don't take so easily to internet services, retired people. And of course, if you can save a penny, then people flocked into the internet services. Also, why banks did it. Of course, they could then close their branches because nobody was visiting them. I mean, I don't know how many years, but in Estonia, 99% of transactions happen online. So they offered their services free, which created for retired people an incentive to, instead of going to a bank's office, to going to a village library, because then you didn't have computers at every home. It was closer also, very comfortable, and use the bank services online. What you now see, this was 20 years ago at the turn of the century. What you now see is a generation of grandmothers who feel very comfortable using Facebook. For us, during this pandemic in the old people's home, it was perfectly feasible to spread iPads and other opportunities for elderly people to stay in contact with their younger, younger generations. Many of them were doing it anyway. So this is a positive spillover effect into the society created by working hard on making our policy in internet service provision inclusive. You have to work this way. Another important societal effect is that we have to realize that our children growing up do not have this kind of day-to-day uh, -day low risk, short human interactions, which we had growing up by which we learned how to be a compassionate human being in the society, getting our own way in the society without offending other people. Like we went to the shop and learned how to buy an ice cream. This was a, numer a number of human interactions, maybe taking a bus, talking in the shop, coming out of the shop, checking out, social interaction. Now our children do this without any interaction. So the education system, and this is counterintuitive really, because people think there's so much technology, we need to teach children technology. No, we need to teach children how to remain compassionate human beings to each other. We have to much more dedicate our education system towards this kind of social education. Because the technology, first of all, what they will be using in 20 years time, we don't know what it is. And second, the current technology, they get well enough themselves. And also, I mean, learning in school is more and more uh, also gadget laden. So they definitely learn technology. Similarly, like we just going by our little, little people doings, learn social interaction. They are now learning technology this way naturally, but social interaction is something we need to teach more and more. So indeed there are big societal effects. Thank you, Thank you very much. There is a question linked to this uh, from the written questions, which is, which is asked by Virgil Maginian, I'm sorry, I mispronounced the name perhaps, who um, mentions the risk of social depersonalization and also gives an example. We are now doing online teaching for, let's say, half a year since April when we started. And uh, if I may make this personal remark, I can feel some elements of this depersonalization in those times when the pandemic does not um, allow us to meet students. So um, would this, what you said in the end of your speech and you said, said just now, would this include also a strategy against this depersonalizing, depersonalizing effects? Definitely, even if you think of the uh, digital area where the money has been made from digital, in fact, it has only been made in providing for human interactions online. Skype, Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, they are all communication tools. So indeed, 
human interaction is, is very important. And most money online is also made from human interaction, not from, I mean, lying cables or, or take, taking the humans out of the chain. Where we are seeing depersonalization in the society, then apart from education and culture provision, we're normally quite happy to go with it. I mean, it's a, it's a low value communication that you have to check your luggage in, isn't it? I mean, you really don't miss it. So what internet allows us is to get rid of these kind of interactions which are tiresome and which we don't want anymore and allows us to choose which kind of interactions we then want. If there is no pandemic, then probably we mostly choose to go out and real, meet people in the real time. But even online, we can see that most money is made from social communication services online. Question is how to make these safe. And I believe that... Um, if you know, and we see this here in Estonia, because for 20 years, people now use their digital IDs. We have a generation who has always known that digital is only safe if you know who has been logged in on the other side and you are also logged in as yourself. So first it's safe, you know, with whom you're talking and second, it's encrypted. Then you understand this way that the rest of the internet is not safe as well. It's, it's there for fun. You can make fun and use it for fun, but you can trust it the same way like you trust the uh, secure space. This doesn't help with depersonalization. And I'm, I believe that um, this is something with which we need indeed to deal with our, within our education and, and culture services system. Because I am not one of those people who says we don't want to meet people anymore. Quite to the contrary. I argue that by getting rid of the low quality unnecessary daily interactions, we can really concentrate on the important bigger ones. And then they will continue happening also offline. If you look at the schools which uh, teach uh, children or, or even, uh, even grown-ups, uh, lots of computing schools, if they offer uh, learning by moving from one level to another in computer system, most of these schools look like, uh, like a computer game. Let's think of the Ecole 42 in Paris or Lyon, for example. They specifically create the social interaction space. They offer social interaction space for physical, real gatherings. And of course, social interaction space online when we cannot meet because it's virus. But they pay great attention to making sure their geeks do not become social parts, that they remain members of the society. And this is necessary for all of us in the future. Absolutely necessary. So technology doesn't resolve these issues that we are drawn to, naturally drawn to other human beings, but it makes space for only good quality interactions, which we value. Okay. I trust I will be interrupted when we are running out of time. And if I am not, I would have two questions uh, still to be asked. The first is by Benedict Wurdak. We can't hear you. Microphone's off. Now I'm, mute. I'm muted. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much, Madam President, for your speech. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rufford. Um, I have a question regarding those safeguards against unauthorized access you spoke of, and not their, uh, not how they work in reality, but rather how they will be negotiated in the political process, uh, developing the legal framework of those safeguards. Because I imagine negotiating a European legal framework might be very different from negotiating a national framework. And considering the recent news of a draft, draft resolution surfaced, surfaced from the uh, council uh, about how messenger services should be obliged to implement backdoors for government uh, agencies, I wonder how do you propose to defend safeguards against unlaw or rather um, expansive snooping access by um, government agencies in the political process. Thank you very much. First of all, we do not attempt to regulate the whole internet. We don't take any responsibility for the data which people give away on Facebook, on Google, in Amazon, elsewhere. We do not guarantee any safety for that. If any of these companies decided to make access to their system possible with Estonian digital ID, 
then we would guarantee the safety of that data provision for these people who have been logged in with the digital ID, because then we would be able to support this service with encrypted channel and safe access and lack of anonymity. So this way we can make secure the environment for those companies with these services who want to be involved. By the way, the banks I was talking about, they are not Estonian, they're Scandinavian banks, yet in the Estonian ecosystem, they exercise based on Estonian digital ID, because this is protected both by technology and also by the legal space. Now back to the framework and how to create it. Well, it starts from the point where you say that the data does not belong to the government. It belongs to the citizen. And the citizen is the only one who can control all the data about this particular citizen and those people who are dependent on them, their children, for example. State takes responsibility to keep this data safe, not to aggregate it unnecessarily, also to keep it in separate databases in this format that let's say somebody who checks whether I have a valid driver's license cannot see that I have diabetes too. This is separation of the data space. And then of course, the legal space was relatively easy to create, but like all legal spaces, for example, like traffic code, the enforcement is the issue. And indeed, in the beginning, we had an, some cases which went to the court because somebody had checked how, how much their uh, last girlfriend's new boyfriend is earning, for example. And if a few cases like this went to the court, people realized that, I mean, this is real. This traffic code for data protection is real. So they stopped doing it. But if they do it nowadays, the punishment can be quite harsh. I can give you an, uh, an, uh, an example which we had in one Estonian hospital. One doctor fell ill gravely, really was ill. And her, his, uh, his colleagues really wanted to help. And because they were doctors, they had access to his data. So they looked and discussed how to best help him. But they were not the treating doctor. And even if when this doctor recovered, he said, I have absolutely no claim against my colleagues who were just from, I mean, they wanted to help me. That's why they accessed my data. Yet this didn't help. They were prosecuted and fined because this is not what you're allowed to do. So creating the legal space is one thing, implementing it and, and policing, if you wish, is another thing. You have to be relatively strict for people to realize that there are no exceptions. Like if you are taking your, uh, your, uh, your, uh, your wife who is about to give birth to the hospital, the policeman may understand why you went 250 kilometers per hour, but you will still get the punishment for that offense, wouldn't you? Similarly, you protect the digital data space. Creation of it starts from the interest of a person. And no government can gather any data about their citizens without these promises of safety. It is done also in the analog world, but these claims your data is safe in our hands in analog world are not so easy, easily verified by the citizen. In digital world, you can have more control and this can be demonstrated to people. This is how you keep developing the space. People realize they have actually more control and they demand that this control be kept even when they at the same time demand proactive services which means that our citizens now say that I am entitled to a certain social benefit and you know it. So why do I even have to apply online? You could allow databases to just come to this conclusion and pay me. And this is happening in one case in Estonia. Retired people who live alone in Estonia are entitled to a top up to their pension. And they don't have to even know about this service. If database knows they are retired and live alone, their pension is automatically a little bit higher. See. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, the next question, or the last question now, is asked by Josefine Robens. And the time uh, she takes to switch on the um, screen and so on, I allow myself to add in another question uh, which you can answer together, which is added, which is asked by the ambassador of Mali to Germany, who asked whether the European Union shouldn't have a strategy also to include other continents 
into its digitization uh, efforts. So now, um, Frau Rubens and um, perhaps M M Madam President, if you wish, you can say also something on the African issue uh, uh, in this context. Frau, Mrs. Rubens, please. Um, hello, firstly, thank you very much for your time. Um, so the last question would be um, about the European values and how you think that um, a digitalized Europe would help um, creating a new dialogue about the values in Europe since um, in recent times they were, um, yeah, there were huge discussion, discussions about that. Mm -hmm. I am sad to say, but digital is no magic tool. I mean, the culture you have, even if you digitalize, will remain the same. For example, if you are a country which well, it's not a democracy, then you would know on your people's data, be it in analog or be it in a digital format. If your local governments are corrupt, then simply digitalizing the services will not make them less corrupt. If you have a cumbersome bureaucracy through which citizen finds it very difficult to access the state or the government, then if you digitalize it, you get just a very efficient mess. So, Technology doesn't change anything. Each and every country, when it creates its digital ecosystem, will either recognize this and try to change also their culture, or will just make a big bureaucracy more efficient, which probably will be worse. But when you do digitalization, you normally rationalize. For example, we found out with great surprise that Estonia fell in OECD index for government digitalization. And we didn't understand it. And then we looked what was measured. Among the measured processes, we found several which in Estonia didn't exist anymore. But we actually got zero points for them because they were not digitalized, but they didn't exist anymore because they are unnecessary in a digital ecosystem. So I'm sorry, you have to still show leadership in developing your society to being more accessible to the citizen. Digital is not a magic tool. Now to the Mali and EU uh, question. Indeed, European Union, uh, when it uh, decided on, uh, on working together with the African Union and also channeling the European bilateral aids and EU help for infrastructure development in Africa, made digital infrastructure eligible part of this infrastructure fund. It is still hard to get throughput in digital infrastructure because, I mean, all systems and structures are used to uh, dealing with roads and, and bridges and all this, and not so much on digital infrastructure. But in principle, it is possible to use the EU uh, infrastructure support resources in Africa for these purposes. Estonia, during our Council presidency and also during our UN Security Council campaign, realized that we a small country as we are catalyzed in Europe can be most beneficial for helping African nations to develop their digital space by cooperating with Smart Africa and African Union. We have a bilateral memorandum of understanding. And if, to put it very simply, Estonia could afford to spend maybe half a million euros on bilateral cooperation in Africa. Instead of creating embassies the old fashioned way and manning them with ambassadors, we created a memorandum of understanding between Estonia and African Union, helping the smart Africa with standardization and digital development of the continent. This was our choice. Indeed, we are strong supporter and promoter of development of a global services market and keeping the access to data spaces in Europe open for the third country citizens. Why? Because I have nothing against somebody a graphic designer or a bookkeeper or a financial consultant from Mali working in my labor space. From this stems for me a very important question. How can these people pay taxes so that your society as well benefits? This is a global question. This is an OECD level question, which we need to access there and also the WTO level question. Uh, we need to realize that global that market on services is now going global like it went on goods, but it is going global piggybacking on individual people, not so much multinational companies. This is a complex problem we need to resolve so that 
both sides of digital cooperation could benefit as societies. Madam President, thank you so much for discussing that long with us to take your time and you see that what you said um, caused a lot of questions. There is a need for discussion and you did not uh, stop discussing it, discussing it with us and to give us answers on the many questions we had. Now, in the beginning of the, um, of just before what we call the first lockdown in, in March, we have the privilege to be a host of your embassy because the national holiday of Estonia is in February and everything was still open. And we had, we, since then, I'm in contact with your embassy and in particular with uh, Mr. Pibor, who's, who's just, I would say, a friend of our, has become a friend of our institute in the time because we had to postpone your, your speech, which was, which was scheduled for May. And we now have this, um, improvised sort of uh, um, digital uh, form of discussion. But it was all worth it, as, as I, if I can say so. It is, it is a great pleasure uh, to have you, uh, having you with us. And I would say, as Mr. Pibo is a friend uh, of uh, the Institute, I feel a bit a friend of Estonia now because of the meeting in February and because of what I'm hearing from you, although and of seeing this marvelous room you are in the original room from uh, opening the president's office in 1938. Well, thank you so much uh, for honoring uh, us with your uh, visit, Madam President. And I hope we will meet in person sometime. And I hope you will have, although it was only a screen for you, you will have a good memory of Humboldt University Berlin. Thank you so much on behalf of all of us. Feel applauded, although you can't hear it over the Baltic Sea. Thank you. Thank you very much. And indeed, this is the world we now live in. And uh, as I said, I am currently self-isolating for having a contact five days ago with somebody with the virus. So uh, I'm very happy that you provided such an interesting an hour and 20 minutes for me in, in my lonely self-isolation. Also, I am, of course, sorry that I couldn't be there uh, personally, and one day I am sure when we are all vaccinated, we will meet again. But I believe that for the future, quite a number of these kind of lectures will be given online. And after all, internet is a spacey place, bigger than an auditorium. So thank you. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you, Madam President. Have a good time. I hope everything goes well, uh, personally around you and for your country. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye to everyone. Thank you. Bye.